Good morning, everybody. Hello, and a very warm welcome to all of you. My name is Dharmendra Kanani. I'm Director of Insights at Friends of Europe. And it's great to welcome you all to this conversation with um, the EU Commissioner uh, for Justice. Uh, we have Didier Rendes with me today. Um, and we look forward to having a, a robust exchange full of lots of questions, I'm sure, from all of you and an interesting engagement. We have uh, two sets of audiences. We have our uh, people on Zoom here. Um, and I, all I ask you to do, those of you on Zoom, can I ask that you, all of you make sure your camera is on? So just make sure that your camera's on, that's great. Your name's there, that's very helpful to us. So it can, we can negotiate and manage this whole discussion effectively. Um, and then we have uh, our audience on live stream. And those of you who are um, hoping to ask questions, use Twitter, hashtag FOE debate, for any questions that you have uh, for us, for, for Commissioner uh, Reinders. So uh, without further ado, let me, let me start by uh, firstly welcoming you, Didier, to this uh, conversation with on how to make the rule of law work in a crisis. At the best of times, we know the EU has been criticised for not really upholding its capacity for the rule of law. But at the time of crisis, we know that the situation, the circumstances perhaps are different, the stakes are higher, the risk is greater. And what we know just from this weekend, we've seen what happened in Poland. Um, we've seen what's been happening in Hungary, but then your portfolio is not just in relation to that. You have a massive portfolio covering everything from, you know, you're, you cover every aspect of the Commission's portfolio in terms of justice. So you have GDPR in there, you have digital, you have businesses complying with legislation and the rule of law, etc. So there's a whole range and a raft there. But before we get into the, the first question I have for you, I wanted to um, enter the kind of the personal space, if I may, with you in terms of leadership. And I've been asking this question of all the commissioners I've been in conversation with. And it occurs to me, and I'm sure it occurs to all of us that are watching you and are watching politics and politicians. The COVID pandemic, the crisis that's hit us, is one of the most significant um, shocks to any of our systems, personal, collective, community, societal. As a leader with such a huge portfolio in a new mandate, you've been very significant in, in, uh, here in, in Belgium also. But for you, what's been the biggest leadership challenge or the leadership learning in your portfolio as a result of this pandemic crisis? Didier, welcome. Thank you, and thank you for such an opportunity to discuss with you. Uh, maybe to answer your question, uh, I need to say that uh, it's become to be a tradition to uh, face some crisis. I was in charge for the presidency of the Eurogroup in 2001, when we have had the uh, September the 11, and we know that uh, many years later we have also had a new terrorist attacks in Europe, in Brussels, like Paris, but in many other countries. So it was a very specific shock to react about the security issue. Uh, in the same way, 10 years ago, I was in charge of the, as finance minister during the, the bank crisis and the sovereign debt crisis. But here, we have a very specific uh, uh, crisis everywhere in the world, uh, without uh, any exception, and with uh, difficult measures uh, to uh, limit some uh, uh, freedoms of people. Uh, first of all, the freedom of uh, movement. It's uh, quite impressive to see the lockdown of so many uh, people, billions of people everywhere on the earth. So about the leadership, the two main issues, first is the coordination of the uh, actions at the national level, because you know that hurts, it's a national competence. And it was quite difficult for the Commission to try to uh, organize a good coordination from the beginning. We have seen different reactions in the Member States, mm. and it was uh, our task and the task of the President Bordelain to uh, to try to organize a good coordination about the, the way to react and to close the border, now maybe to reopen the borders, mm -hmm. but also to uh, give uh, uh, room for maneuver at the budgetary side, to give more flexibility of, uh, on, the, on the stage head and so on. That's the first element of leadership. So to take day after day more and more decisions to organize a better coordination and to be more united against the virus. And the second element, maybe more in my portfolio, is um, to, to have a sort of uh, uh, reinforcement of our capacity to protect the rule of law. Because it was a decision in the last months to do that. You know that we need to work this year 
on the first annual report on the rule of law. It's quite new. It's a decision of last year, so it's very recent. But during the crisis, uh, with all those emergency measures, I'm sure that we need to show a real leadership with the capacity to be in touch with all the member states, but also, if it's needed, to introduce uh, infringement proceedings or to introduce other kind of procedures to be sure that we will maybe have a, a very uh, uh, secure situation. We were one of the uh, only places in the world with others, of course, we have some partners, uh, to enter in the uh, crisis with a democracy, uh, with a respect for our values. And we need to go out of the crisis with the same democracy and with the same capacity to protect the values. So that's the, the main issue in my portfolio, maybe, to be sure that we have a real leadership about the protection of the rule of law and the capacity to uh, insist on a full respect on our values, also during uh, the crisis time. Thank you very much for that. So on that very specific point, um, tell me, from, from your experience so far, and people have been watching the news over the weekend, seeing what's happened in Poland, people have been watching what's happening more widely in Hungary and elsewhere, um, and the fact that people are rushing to a much more of an autocratic, one might say, rule by decree approach. What are the levers what are the you know what are the incentives and sanctions to play by the games but play by the rules of the eu game from your perspective but first of all i said it's possible to uh, continue to analyze different evolutions in different member states and if it's needed uh, to continue to introduce i said the uh, infringement uh, uh, proceedings it was the case about poland at the beginning of the year so before the crisis against uh, the disciplinary procedure uh, against some judges in Poland. We have decided to ask to the Court of Justice uh, to uh, take some interim measures, and it was done on the 8th of April. The Court of Justice decided to suspend all the disciplinary proceedings in Poland. But uh, during the crisis, we have decided to go uh, forward. We have decided also to go to the court again about the so-called Muslim law, the new law on judiciary in Poland and it was in the end of April, to be sure that it's possible also to defend the independence of the judiciary. So we continue uh, to do that. But we uh, organize also a sort of process about all those uh, uh, emergency measures taken by the different member states. You know that we have uh, maybe 22 member states uh, in a state of uh, urgency or a state of danger, like was uh, mentioned in, uh, in Hungary. And I've asked one month ago to the Commission to organize a real monitoring on all those emergency measures because we need to be sure that also during the crisis it's possible of course to react very rapidly because we support the way to react rapidly in the different member states to protect the, the public health and of the citizens it's a, a main task so we are uh, so solidarity with the uh, with full solidarity with the member states about that but we need to to, to verify if it's possible to have a full respect for the fundamental rights, fundamental rights and for the, the values. And uh, the uh, analysis of all the, the measures is ongoing. We will continue to do that because all the measures need to be uh, uh, necessary and proportionate and strictly proportionate. And uh, we have uh, uh, seen that in, in many member states is the case, but we have some specific concerns. You know that, uh, first of all, we have real concerns in Hungary due to the fact that there is no clear term to the uh, state of danger. Indeed. It's just possible for the government to go out. And we have another concern about Hungary because there is a new incrimination about the dissemination of false information. And of course, if it's about the virus, why not? There is existence so in other member states, but uh, it's also a risk about the uh, freedom of expression and freedom of press because it's maybe also about some criticism in regard to the decision taken by the government. Okay, I'm sure people have, from our audience will have questions in regard to that. Now, let, we've, we've, we've come, started with, you know, what happens at, you know, with member states. What about the private sector? Your portfolio covers a whole range of uh, uh, responsibilities that cut into the heart of private sector activity. Your, uh, you've brought out due diligence guidance, your own survey. So you commissioned uh, a study uh, that shows that only one in three to four businesses are actually to undertaking due diligence that, that it looks at the impact on human rights uh, and the planet. Um, what more 
can the what more and can should the private sector be doing in the context of both your guidance but also the relationship you have with them as we think about recovery but making sure we protect people and planet but uh, to be very concrete you have seen that before the, the COVID-19 crisis uh, we have decided at the commission level to uh, organize a green deal and to start a real a new policy about the fight against climate change but we have also decided to launch a consultation on artificial intelligence and to, to be sure uh, that it will be possible to organize a real transition to a, a digital uh, world and uh, to use better digital technology is the case during the uh, uh, pandemic because you see that we have organized many many meetings by video and uh, it's quite new and we will see many changes in all the different parts of the society but uh, to be sure that it will be possible to continue to uh, organize the, the recovery uh, after the crisis with the same goals, uh, a green transition and a digital transition, we need to uh, take different kind of initiatives. I don't want to mention all, of course, we will in my portfolio, I will try to organize a better e-justice, to invest in more in digital tools for justice. I will try also to take the consumers on mm. board of the transition about the uh, uh, digital transition with sales online, but also with uh, the green transition, with uh, better information about the way to use sustainable uh, products and services. But we need also to organize a process with the companies. And it's the reason why I've said uh, that we will work on a better uh, sustainable corporate governance. That means that uh, uh, during the crisis, you know that uh, we have seen an increasing of inequalities inside the European Union, maybe Indeed. in different parts of the Union, but also abroad, with many partners in, in the world. And uh, there are two elements, in fact. Uh, it was, it's not exactly new, because uh, in the new circular economic uh, action plan, we have decided to launch uh, a, a proposal, a initiative proposal in 2021. But I want to do two things, to be mm. very concrete. The first one is a due diligence about the supply chain. How is possible to ask to all the companies to uh, verify that there is a full respect for environmental, social, but human rights issues uh, in the use of uh, many uh, different actors in the supply chain. And you know that in the past we have had a lot of accidents and a lot of real problems uh, in the supply chain. And we will ask, we ask to all the different uh, companies to do that. And the second is the director's duty. Uh, it's not enough to have a, um, a due diligence on the supply chain. We will also to ask to define a medium and long-term strategy in relation with uh, environmental issues, social issues, human rights issues, maybe uh, for the climate change about science, uh, on the basis of scientific research. And it will be very important for the, the board of the companies to express their strategy with not only short-term vision, but also medium and long-term. And we are working on it. We have uh, launched a different consultation. The first one has proved that there is a real um, request from many companies to do that. The majority of companies in Europe are asking to, to organize the process. And now we are at the end of a second consultation about the director duties and director duties. And I'm sure that uh, we'll see the same. So uh, why are we doing that? You know that there are some pledges and some uh, actions on a voluntary basis by different companies, but we need to be sure that there is a capacity to enforce the commitment taken by the companies. And we need also to organize a level playing field. Uh, it's not just with a part of the uh, business community, but with all that we need to work. So that's a very, very concrete issue when we will uh, launch the recovery plan with the new MFF, maybe at the new uh, financing uh, for the next years at the European level. Mm. It will be very important to take care of that. And to, be, to conclude, I want to say that to take care of two issues, maybe in the MFF it will be very important to organize a conditionality between the financing of different policies and the rule of law. And uh, there is a proposal of the Commission is in, on the table of the Council with uh, a very clear uh, mechanism with a reverse qualified majority to be sure that it will be efficient. So we want to verify that we are financing policies in member states, having a full respect for the rule of law. And for the companies, we try to do the 
the same analysis yes. with such a kind of process, the due diligence of the supply chain and the medium and long term strategy. Didier, that sounds like a policy breakthrough proposition. I have to say, there'll be a lot of people thinking, my goodness, the notion of conditionality. <laughs> I mean, I'd like to be at that table when that conversation takes place because I can just imagine what member states and you know the, the, the politicians will make of what you're suggesting. And I just hope that the the absence of solidarity we've seen thus far, which has moved to a certain extent, is shown in that proposal because that could be a bit of a game changer in your area because when we think about the rule of the law and when we think about how do you use the proper levers, what you're describing, i.e. Money, money matters, money bites, money can force action and change behaviour in various ways. But we also know we need to create that sense of a value base where people believe it's not just about chasing the money. From your perspective and your experience today, I mean, that's a, that's a really interesting point you've just made, but where both of these elements come together, we know that 70% of chief executives believe due diligence should work. It's their shareholders, they say, are not prepared to play ball. So there's some other thing about corporate governance you've raised, but where the two elements of what we discussed come together is tracing. And the whole element of um, how from potentially in our pockets, our mobile phone will have data uh, which uh, on the one level can protect our health uh, or at least uh, enable us to think more differently and better about detecting, diagnosing and understanding the nature of the problem. Um, we know that GDPR has been a huge breakthrough globally as a good practice model uh, on data privacy. But how do you make sure that the two elements of the private sector responsibility to make sure they play by the rules of the game in terms of what they do with data? Because we know we know about various companies that have done things with data they haven't told us about, um, and, which you know very well. And the Commission's been really successful in finding some large companies in that respect. But then keeping people on side, because the citizen element, the sense of trust amongst people in Europe is going to have to be a, a premium for you and a prize if you get this right. Comments from you, Didier. But uh, first of all, I want to say, because you spoke about the shareholders, that when we uh, speak about uh, a sustainable corporate governance, it's just to take care not only on the shareholders, but also of all the stakeholders, and also the workers in the company, the workers in the supply chain, and so on. And I said with different other kind of approaches about uh, environmental, social, and human rights issues, and not just the financial results of the company. So that's uh, the way to, to manage that. I know it's possible to try to uh, have an influence in different specific situations, like the use of uh, apps uh, for the uh, uh, contact tracing mm. uh, during the crisis and during the exit strategy now, because we are going slowly uh, out of the lockdown. Uh, I want to say two things. First, we have um, uh, different principles in the regulation. You know that the GDPR provides uh, for a legal framework for data protection, where it fit in, in times of uh, epidemics. It's uh, the first uh, worldwide mm -hmm. uh, regulation on, on this, and we have seen some positive evolutions in other parts of the world to try to do the same uh, in California, in uh, South Korea, in different uh, parts of uh, uh, the world, like in Japan, we have seen the different evolutions. So we need to, to uh, work with uh, a, a framework of rules like the GDPR also during the, the crisis. And we will publish, you know, an evaluation of uh, uh, the use of the GDPR in June and the, the idea is to uh, see if it's possible to have a better enforcement everywhere in Europe of the GDPR. Mm. But about the uh, uh, contact tracing apps, uh, we have tried to, to show a leadership and we have taken uh, some decisions before the use of the apps in Europe. Uh, the first one was to publish a recommendation about a toolbox, what kind of technical uh, elements, if I, if I may, to give two examples, interoperability yeah uh, we don't um, we are not sure that it's useful to have just one european app but it's possible to have different apps in different member states but if you have that you need to have an interoperability of the, the apps and to just to have cross-border uh, solutions and the second one is the cyber security to be sure that it's uh, real secure that's for the recommendation about the the way to organize a process uh, mm. and the, the use of bluetooth and not the use of the geolocalization but on the other hand, we have also published a guidance about the full compliance with the GDPR. And to, to say what? It must be first of, on a voluntary basis that it will be possible to use those apps. So you need to agree to take such a 
app to download such an apps on your sure. smartphone. You need to agree to use that. We need to have a very uh, small period of uh, storage of data and a small a number of data. It's just the data needs needed to uh, uh, the uh, tracing. And then it will must be on the control of the health uh, national authorities and not on and law enforcement authorities on orders. And so we have put in a guidance all the different elements. Of course, we will verify that because you know that we have a network of national uh, data protection authorities with the board at the European level. And of course, if there are some uh, reasons to take initiatives and to try to force uh, the different companies or the different actors to fulfill all the uh, criteria of the GDPR, it will be the case. So we have taken a, a sort of leadership in such a, a way before the use of those apps at the open okay. level. And I want just to add that you know that there are also some more classical ways to uh, organize the process and the tracing uh, on a manual basis by phone call and then a data bank in the health uh, department. And there also I have asked to verify the full compliance of those uh, uh, kind of approaches with the GDPR. So, um, in fact, you need to have a global vision with a regulation. It will be the same for the sustainable corporate governance. It's the sure. same for the GDPR. And then to verify case by case if it's possible to apply those rules to a specific situation like the tracing apps. And if it's needed, of course, to take some initiative to force the member states to apply uh, the good, uh, uh, in a good way the GDPR and, of course, to force the company to follow those principles. Absolutely. And thank you for that. But what we do know from our experience to date is that values and money don't go hand in hand. And when a citizen or a group of citizens find out that actually their data has been misused or it's been stored or it's been sold on, you feel very troubled and insecure about knowing where you turn to to actually access your rights. And our experience has been fines are great, but what you do about individual protection uh, and the roots to that protection are, um, are very significant. On that note, and I'll come back to you on that one. I want to bring in our um, uh, people from our citizens platform. Um, colleagues, you know we have Debating Europe, which is our uh, citizens pl uh, online platform where citizens weekly debate issues that matter to them around what Europe means to them and what's important to them in relation to leadership and a whole range of other issues. So I want to invite Joe. Joe, are you there? We have a question yes. from a citizen. Yeah. Hello, yes, I'm first Littemendra. introduce yourself and then tell us what the question is, Joe. Good morning, Commissioner. Good morning. My name is Joe Litabaski. I'm the editor of Debating Europe, um, which, Demendra, as Demendra has introduced, it's Friends of Europe Citizen Discussion Platform. Um, so I'll bring in a, a question here, uh, or a comment rather, that we had from Theresa, uh, who points out that democracy and rule of law are being eroded in more than one EU member state, and that is sort of a fundamental problem. She points to both. Poland and, and Hungary. Uh, this is a problem because most of the sanctions that we're talking about uh, require unanimity to be passed and, and kind of very crudely, to put it crudely, Poland will support Hungary, Hungary will support Poland. So even something like adding rule of law conditionality to the MFF would presumably require unanimity to pass. Uh, so how will any meaningful sanctions get around this requirement of unanimity? Joe, thank you very much. And Teresa, for her question. Yeah. I know, yes. a tough one. Did you, you've sort of referred to it, but yes, please, a direct response to that. Yes, maybe a direct response. First of all, uh, we have some capacities to, to uh, react. And I've said, uh, if it's needed, we introduce uh, infringement proceeding before the Court of Justice. And uh, it's with uh, uh, reserve, because if you look to the situation in Poland, since some years, the previous commission and the actual one, have launched some uh, infringement proceedings to uh, the European Court of Justice and with success, with a positive decision of the Court of Justice, again about the disciplinary procedure, procedures against some judges, I said. And we will continue to do that. So we have the first tool, it's the capacity, of course, to go to the Court of Justice because at the end, it's in the end of the Court of Justice to uh, give a correct interpretation of the EU law and to give a correct interpretation of our values. The second element, is the political pressure. It's possible to organize a real dialogue with some member states and to express some concerns. To give a very recent example, uh, it was about the elections in Poland, the presidential elections. Normally, we had elections on the, uh, the last Sunday, in, on the 10th of May, and you have seen that it was possible to postpone due to many criticism inside Poland, but also outside and from the Commission. I have said since uh, 
many weeks that we had a real problem with the organization by postal service of those elections without a real uh, fair campaign for all the candidates and so on. So uh, it's possible to do that. Of course, you're right. Uh, if we enter in a procedure like the Article 7 uh, procedure of the treaty, uh, we have a problem with the rules because you need unanimity or qualified majority. And it's the reason why there is a real proposal of the Commission now to try to uh, organize a conditionality between the MFF, the funding of different policies, and the rule of law. And I insist on the fact that to be efficient, it must be with a reverse qualified majority, like it was possible to do about the budgetary procedure and about the uh, structural reforms in the economic and social field. And you know, it was very needed to take a long period of time after the bank crisis and sovereign debt crisis to have such a kind of mechanism. So I'm hoping that we will move, but it's very recent. To be concrete, I've started in another capacity as Minister of Foreign Affairs and European Affairs uh, in 2016 mm. to ask to organize a peer review on the rule of law. Before, it was very difficult to discuss on, on the rule of law at the council level. And the Commission has started also the, those procedures since some years. And last year, I've decided, and I conclude with that, uh, to uh, introduce such an idea of an annual report on the rule of law. And I must say that at the end, uh, the best pressure will be with the financing, but the other pressure will come from a real debate mm. at the national level. I have the uh, intention to come with our first annual report on the rule of law in September before the Commission, and then to go to the three institutions, the Commission of course, but also the Parliament and the Council, but also to organize debates at the national level, in the national Parliament, with civil society, because it's the best way to push pressure at the end uh, for a full respect of the rule of law is to have a real culture of the rule of law and to all install a real debate at the national level. Which is true. For the moment, we don't have uh, all the possible instruments. It's the reason why we ask the conditionality. Mm. But we, it's possible to push political pressure and it's possible also to go to the court with some success. There is that element. Thank you for that. About how do you enable and generate greater trust among citizens to know that whilst I'm in Poland, I can count on the EU to hear my voice because of the values that it enshrines. And there's, I, I, I think it's really good that you're thinking of having some sort of annual public reporting on the rule of law, because I think that will be an effective way of really being kind of much more transparent about who's kind of uh, kicking the can down the street or who's actually working with democracy and the, the health, uh, health of uh, the rule of law standards in a nation. But that's, that's one thing. But how do you bring citizens along is going to be really important. I would like to ask uh, those of you who are keen to ask a question from our Zoom audience push put your hands up you know your virtual hands not your actual hands your virtue you have a virtual hand so those of you who would like to ask a question please do raise your virtual hand so I, that we can manage this conversation and directly uh, engage you I have one question already uh, I have Katalin Katalin Halmai are you there you need to unmute yourself Yes. Hello. I don't hear you. No, I don't hear you either. Katalin? We can't hear you. Okay. So hopefully, if you can put your question in a chat format if you can't access the the audiovisual effectively enough apologies for that we have a we have another question from uh, on on our from our live stream audience so charlotta where are you yes i'm here hello Hi. introduce yourself and what's the question I'm Charlotte, um, I'm a program assistant from Friends of Europe and I'm going to read out a question from our audience on the live streams from Twitter regarding the tracing apps uh, for COVID-19. So um, one question would be how likely is it for member states to agree on a certain level of coherence for COVID-19 tracing apps uh, so that they facilitate the opening of borders within the Schengen area also with regards to summer vacations and the way forward out of the crisis. Commissioner, back over to you. 
Yeah. May I react? Yes, oh, no, please no. do. Okay, I've tried to understand because it's not easy about the, the sound, but uh, of course, I said we, we have tried to provide um, different tools to the, the member states to see what kind of use, possible use of the apps. But the, the most important element, of course, to us is the full compliance with the GDPR. And uh, not only inside the Schengen, Schengen area, but uh, the entire European Union, and also with uh, different partners abroad, if we try to use those uh, apps, we need to be sure that it will be in full compliance with the GDPR. And uh, I know that in other part of the world it was possible to use uh, those apps sometimes maybe in, uh, in another way, and not all the time with uh, the consent of the users, but uh, we, we ask to all the different partners to stay in the same framework, so to uh, have a full respect for the rules of the GDPR. And, uh, the guidance was very clear. We have organized that with the board, the uh, European uh, Data Protection Board at the European level, so with all the national uh, uh, data protection authorities uh, inside the European Union. And I'm sure that uh, it's possible to use uh, okay. those apps to, to go out of the crisis, to organize the exit strategy, and maybe to have a better cross-border approach to open better the borders inside the Schengen zone. I, I want to insist on one point. Of course, I uh, uh, be uh, responsible for the non-discrimination of the free movement inside the Schengen uh, uh, zone and inside the European Union. So I'm sure that with the use of those apps, it will be easier uh, to try to organize a coordination of the reopening of the borders. Okay, thank you very much. I'm going to move straight to Anna. Anna Gomez, yes. where are you? Can yeah. you hear me? Hello. Yeah. Hi. Warm Hello. welcome. Please do introduce yourself. And well, I'm a, a diplomat and a former MEP, um, and I was a member of a uh, Libe committee. I'd like to ask uh, Commissioner uh, regarding this evaluation of the um, uh, GDPR. Uh, are you um, considering as well the strengths of the national authorities? Because the big problem about this evaluation of the GDPR is that many of the national authorities are not properly equipped uh, humanely and even uh, legally to actually make a difference. And, and Emily, during this crisis, I think we have been watching several instances of that. And then on the uh, tracing apps, um, how do you um, ensure that there is compliance with the GDPR, namely uh, when uh, the developers of the apps, be it European or Chinese or American, uh, would uh, make use of the data uh, for improper uh, purposes, mm -hmm. considering the GDPR. Uh, we have the case of Cambridge Analytica very clear in mind. Anna, thank well, you very much. So the question of, you know, capacity of national authorities and, and you know, making sure a, a compliance works. Oh, first of all, thank you for those questions. Uh, I've said that in June, my services will uh, uh, publish an evaluation report on the uh, application of the GDPR. So I don't uh, have the intention to open the Pandora box of some change in the GDPR. It would be needed, but it's very uh, complex to try to move on this. But we'll focus on the provisions on the international transfers of personal data and, like you asked, on the cooperation and consistency between national data protection authorities. Uh, because we need to be sure that we have the same kind of implementation of the GDPR in the entire Europe. And, uh, of course, however, we will also uh, include the analyze of the actual situation during the crisis. But the main goal will be that, so to be sure that we have a correct uh, application of the GDPR at the national level with a good cooperation with the uh, uh, national data protection authorities. And it's the reason why we try to work with the network and the European Data Protection, uh, uh, protection Board. And it's very important to, to do that because uh, uh, it's the first issue to have a correct application at the national level. And um, about the uh, apps, of course, we have uh, published, I said, um, uh, a guidance about the full respect of the uh, GDPR. It was on the 16th April, so it was before the use of those apps by one of the other member states. 
and it's uh, uh, real capacity to control that because we will, uh, of course, uh, organize a real transparency about the, <coughs> the content of the apps. It's that uh, we are we are working on it with Thierry Breton, my colleague in charge for this, this part of the process, and we will organize a real control of it. And uh, it's a question of trust. In fact, you're right. Uh, if we want to have a real use by the, the the citizens, it's important that we have shown to the citizens that there are some limits in the possible use of those apps. And so we'll organize a real transparency about the functioning of the apps and a real capacity to control that. And of course, uh, we are not against the use of apps coming from abroad, but it must be with the same full respect for the GDPR and for the guidance that we have published. And I repeat, the first element is to work off, uh, on a, a voluntary base. So you need to have the uh, consent of the user to download the apps and to say, yes, I uh, open to see the use of these uh, apps for such an, uh, for another uh, application. Uh, to be concrete, to send information or maybe to do more and to alert people where they were in proximity uh, of an infect people. And again, through, uh, through the, the Bluetooth and not so much through the geolocalization. So we have fixed some limits and we will control, of course, the content uh, of those uh, apps. But for the moment, you, you know, there are not so many uh, apps in use at the open level and we have to take care to publish our uh, recommendations okay. and our guidance before. Okay, uh, Anna, can I bring you back? Because, you know, just briefly, very briefly, what you thought of that response in terms of what yep. you're, a, you know, you're a seasoned politician yourself, Anna, you've been, you know, this town, Brussels, you know, the institutions really well. <laughs> Give us your, what's, what would you like to see happen? Very briefly, Anna. Well, what I fear is that actually a lot is already going on without uh, due consideration to these guidance. And mm -hmm. therefore, when you uh, are seized with the matter, you will see that the situation is out of control. Uh, because, of, of course, I do believe that a lot of member states, several member states, are already very dependent on uh, uh, Chinese and American makers of these apps. and. Uh, the situation might be difficult to put under control. Oh, okay, sure a, a, a warning flag there. So, no, did I'm you? sure that uh, it's logical that you send such a warning because it's not easy. But we were the first to publish the GDPR and to have a real regulation of uh, this kind of uh, uh, issue at the open level. And we have, I said, a network of national uh, data protection. Uh, authorities and we will work with those uh, national data protection authorities to enforce the guidance and to ask for full compliance of the GDPR. Of course, if it's not the case, we have different tools uh, to force the different uh, actors to be uh, in uh, full compliance with the GDPR. Uh, I know that it's not easy, of course, because it's uh, quite okay. a new uh, element, but you have seen in the last year that it was possible to uh, have a real impact on the uh, development of different kind of uh, apps at the uh, EU level. But you're right, of course, it's uh, a difficult period of time during the crisis and it was needed uh, to be uh, on time. So to start uh, again, I've said that before the, the beginning of the use of those apps, we didn't want to uh, wait uh, after the, the entry into uh, use of those, uh, those apps at the urban level. So the recommendations are there, the guidance is there, it's a full application of the GDPR and we will verify if it's possible to enforce that with all the different okay. actors, national data protection authorities, but maybe if it's a, a need to do that with the law enforcement authority. Thank you, Didier. I'm going to bring our colleague who was, wasn't able to connect through the visual, audio visual. Charlotte, you have the question from our colleague uh, Halmai. Uh, yes, indeed. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> So um, the question um, is from Katalin Halmai, um, a Hunga Hungarian journalist, um, and she would like to know that um, considering that the Hungarian government suspended a certain EU data protection rights as part of the emergency legislation, um, is there something the European Commission is concerned about and might launch infringement with regards to this? Did you catch yes, that, did uh, you? Of course, of, of yeah. course, before to, to launch infringement, we need to analyze the different measures taken by the different governments. But about those uh, specific decrees taken by the Hungarian government, there is a discussion now in the board. I said we have a European Data Protection Board, and they have a discussion about the different uh, uh, 
uh, decree is decided by the Hungarian government because we have received some concern from uh, different people in Hungary about that. And so we'll have an analyze coming from the European Data Protection Board. And on such a basis, we will see if it's needed or to ask some changes or to uh, go to a different uh, infringement procedure or other kind of procedure. But so, no, no, the, the dossier is in the hand of the uh, European Data Protection Board for the moment. So a discussion with all the different national authorities, not just uh, the Hungarian National Data Protection Authorities, but all the national uh, data protection authorities uh, of uh, the European Union. So that will make for an interesting conversation to see how peer pressure, let's say, from the national authorities, as Anna was saying, both in terms of capacity, of but the peer pressure from the rest of them to say, hang on, guys and girls, this is not good enough. But let's come back to that in a moment. We have uh, quite a few questions now. So, uh, Pierre, Pierre Pozzi? Yeah. Hi, hello. do introduce yes. yourself. Hello, welcome. Yes, hello. Uh, my name is Pierre Pozzi. I Hello, Commissioner Enders. I uh, wear two hats. I'm a, an investor in venture capital in technology in the Silicon Valley. And I'm also uh, uh, a visiting professor, well, a professor at Solvay Business School here in Brussels, but also at uh, Sciences Po in Paris, specifically on the technological race competition between Europe, uh, the United States, and China. Just one word about uh, the technology that we have in California, which is uh, to identify a person in a totally anonymous manner, because it's through the electrical brain signal that the brain emits every time you grab your smartphone. We don't capture any data. I've explained the technology to the previous uh, commission, to Commissioner Vestager and to Commissioner Gabriel. So now we're going open in the market. So we're, the reason why I'm saying that is because we went extremely fast. Uh, we managed to get the first patent in a matter of weeks, which is absolutely amazing. So we are now facing, as a European company, although we're based in California, we are facing, of course, as you can imagine, big competition from the Google and the Apple and all the type of platforms that use data and mine massively data for their own purposes. Um, one quick comment, and here I put my Sciences Po hat uh, uh, in the executive program at Digital Humanities at Sciences Po, the competition is going to be extremely tough. And where I'm really worried mm -hmm. is that the way I see for the first time ever Apple joining forces with Google to go ahead with the app mm -hmm. concerning COVID, I think it has a very short-term use, which can be useful, but I think it's opening wide the doors of the dam that will allow a huge water uh, invasion, so to speak, will be invaded by the fact that it will be extremely difficult to control the capture of medical data. And GDPR, I chapeau, because I was in California and I go back and forth every couple of months. And the Americans, you know, the only thing they really understand, they're very tough competitors, but the only thing they understand is when you really hit them in the wallet, as they say. Yeah. So they were yeah. saying to me, you know, GDPR is zero rubbish. But when it was enacted, I saw really a change, fundamental yeah. change in attitude. So my recommendation would be the following, and it's a comment, but at the same time, I think it's a question. Um, we have to look at the way not only the data specific on COVID is going to be handled, but the future of data that should become common good, certainly within Europe, because we are hostage in Europe of the US platforms and the Chinese platforms, of the GAFA and the BATX, and we have no European platform whatsoever. So, so Pierre, what do, you, what do you are, I understand, them, and Didier will come back to you to that in terms of your question yeah. and so the issue the, you raised about the dam, but what would you the, like the, to see the, happen? You, you've got a commissioner here with, for justice. What would you like, what's your advice, or what would you like to see happen? Two things. The first one is obviously tighten up GDPR fast, fast, because it is not innocent what Apple and Google are doing. And I salute what they're doing because it can help, but I can tell you, and I'm sure Anna understands what I'm saying, and I really appreciate her intervention. I can tell you that this is, I mean, we are a little bit naive uh, in the way I said, you know, as a European, because I know what's behind it and I see what they do with data. And I invite to read one book from Professor Zuboff of Harvard called Surveillance Capitalism. It's absolutely unbelievable what's going on. And the second question or the second point I have is let's not only look at the data related to COVID, let's look at how these data are not only protected by GDPR, but how we can make this data a public good in the European interest. So how do we make sure that those platforms do not repatriate data in the US or in China, and how we make sure that Europe benefits from those data? And there it opens the door to what Commissioner Breton 
has put forward in terms of plans saying this is now the second generation of data coming up is not anymore the personal sure. use of the okay. smartphone but coming from industry okay so data is a social good and a public good which many have spoken Absolutely. about which is key if we may but you need some sort of structure leg regulated framework for that to yeah, work indeed and sorry ju just one quick question on, on one quick point just, just to clarify my thought data is good because at the same time it's a new oil and it's indefinite now for platforms to use it it's normal because they provide a service but at sure. the same time that also has to become a public good totally anonymized to make sure that we in Europe benefit and we're not the hostage of the Americans or the Chinese. This is what's going to happen within 10 years. If that point about fast. data sovereignty in terms of public good. So that's a very Absolutely. important point you're making. Before I ask you to come back to this, uh, Didier, I've got a second question uh, from Xavier Alonso. Xavier, are you there? Uh, yeah, yeah, I'm here. Hello, <laughs> please do introduce yourself. Welcome. Yeah, well, thank you very much. Uh, morning, all. I'm uh, Xavier Alonso, I'm a lawyer and a senior EU policy officer from the delegation to the EU of the government of Catalonia. And uh, uh, I just wanted to know uh, about this con public consultation that the Commission launched uh, some weeks ago and was closed uh, only one, two weeks ago. Uh, whether the Commissioner can give us some information about that consultation, what kind of um, concerns have emerged from that uh, consultation? And which consultation um, are you referring to specifically, Xavier? The consultation on the rule of law. The rule yeah, of law. yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, sorry, yes. sorry, yes. The consultation <laughs> of the rule of law, yes, for this, for this first uh, report to be launched next okay. September. Thank you very much. So, um, do you want to take that one first, because that's you know that's fairly straightforward in terms of you know what what you know what did it say? What we what kind of response have you had? And what, where are you taking it? But well, two two different questions. Of course. Indeed. One, but but I will start maybe with the um, artificial intelligence to be concrete, because I said at the beginning that we have uh, uh, decided at the beginning of this uh, commission uh, to organize a green deal on one side, but also. Uh, a digital process on the other side. So to have two transitions, in fact, the green and the digital transition. And in the digital transition, uh, we have launched a consultation also there uh, till June uh, on artificial intelligence. And I want to answer that that's the, the way to, to try to compete with other actors at the uh, worldwide level. We are knowing that there are uh, some uh, influence coming from the GAFA, or coming from Chinese companies and others in Europe. But we have tried to organize first a data strategy, how it's possible to collect more data in Europe and also from the industry, not only personal data, and to be open to, uh, to try to build a real capacity to work on those data at the open level, maybe with uh, European actors and with many startups, with SMEs, and at the end, maybe with very large companies. So it's a real data strategy that we try to, to put into place. And we try to do that with a real reflection on the use of artificial intelligence in the same way than uh, uh, with the GDPR about the data protection. I want to say that in a European way of thinking about uh, artificial intelligence, that means how it's possible to have a human-centric approach, how it's possible to protect fundamental rights, uh, to be sure that it's possible to don't have any discrimination in the use of uh, artificial intelligence. And again, we have launched a consultation till uh, June. So if it's possible to you to uh, give some uh, advices in this, the consultation, to send some recommendations, why not? We'll take care of all those uh, uh, reactions. And the way is, of course, not to protect Europe, but it's to say we want to uh, organize the framework for all the different actors. So if you want to work in Europe coming from the US or China, you need to fulfill the same uh, rules. You need to uh, be in compliance with the GDPR, but also with all the rules that we will put into place about the use of artificial intelligence. That means a real transparency, because we need to be able to control the algorithms and to give the capacity to law enforcement authorities, to justice, to verify the content of the algorithm. We need also to uh, uh, have a, a real evolution about the safety of products, because we need to change the rules about the, the safety of all the products, including uh, artificial intelligence, and of course the liability. What kind of liability? Uh, to give all the time the same example, if you have a, a car without any driver, who is responsible in the case of an accident? So is it the owner, the producer, the developer of AI? 
And so we'll put into place uh, some rules about that. And of course, like for the GDPR, the difficulty is to be sure that it's possible to control uh, the uh, correct uh, use of all those data at the open level and the correct transfer of data to other part of the world. Because also in the GDPR, we have uh, such a kind of discussion. We try to organize adequacy decisions with, uh, uh, about our relation with some partners. We'll have the case with UK in some months. Uh, or it's possible to be sure that we have the same data protection in UK mm. in the future that we have now inside the European Union. The same for the US, the same for others. So it's true that it's a challenging uh, uh, period of time because we need to accelerate the process to be competitive in Europe about the use of those data and the use of uh, artificial intelligence and the way to be uh, an important actor in the digital world. But uh, at the same moment, how it's possible to try to organize another way to think about those uh, issues with a full respect, I said, for values, for fundamental rights, and uh, to be sure that we don't have discriminations in the use of artificial intelligence. And for that, we need to uh, be very strict on the application of our rules, but we need also to have a, a real discussion with the different partners in the world. And it's maybe, if I may, easier to discuss with some partners in the US than for the moment to discuss with China. We don't have exactly the same reference uh, in the different part of the world. Uh, about the, the rule of law consultation, uh, it's, uh, it's done, so we have launched such a consultation till the 4th of May. We have given some delay till the beginning of May due to the crisis. I must say that we have received many contributions, first of all from the member states, because it was the goal to have uh, contributions coming from the different member states, about the four chapters of the rule of law report, so independence of the judiciary, the fight against corruption, media pluralism, and the checks and balances in the uh, constitutional order. And uh, we have received also many contributions from stakeholders, the classical one, uh, Council of Europe or Fundamental Rights uh, Agency in Vienna, but also many NGOs in Europe. And it's too early to say something about the content, because uh, to be honest, I will have just this afternoon the first meeting with my services to uh, analyze the, the way forward. Okay. Uh, the intention is to organize to be concrete, uh, and I uh, want to inform you uh, about that. Uh, we will organize country visits, maybe video country visits in the next weeks to discuss again with the authorities, but also with all the stakeholders, so also with NGOs and uh, the civil society. So if you are interested in the uh, way forward, we will uh, organize such uh, uh, a contact with uh, all the, the stakeholders in the different member states. And it uh, include academia, industry, civil society. We have received uh, uh, a real uh, uh, huge number of contributions, and it's fine. But it's too early to say something about the content because uh, we'll start the analyze of that. It was uh, indeed the, the, the delay was on the 4th of May, and we have received uh, some contributions in the day after the 4th. Thank you. And so I, I heard that was a Pierre, that was an invitation to share some of your ideas and thinking as you yeah. move forward, as with all of you. But, but Commissioner, I mean, Didier, it would be good to see what you make of the consultation, perhaps invite you back to have a conversation with you about this, because it would be good to, because often politicians lead consultations and you don't know what happens to them. So here's an open <laughs> invitation to come back to us to share with this audience what you make of it. I have a question from two more people as time is running out. I have Carol Thomas. Carol, where yeah. are you? Yeah, I'm here. Hello. Welcome. Hello. Good, good morning. Um, um, thank you, our Commissioner. Um, I'm Carol Thomas. I work for the Council of European Municipalities and Regions. Um, we represent uh, uh, local and regional government associations of local and regional government across uh, not just the, um, the EU, but um, uh, more widely um, in terms of um, uh, European representation. And I wanted to come back to you. Um, uh, thank you for for um, giving us some, you know, the, the thoughts, particularly on, on the conditionality. I wanted to come back to you on the, the comments you made there, because that has been um, a source of uh, concern, um, uh, the discussions that have been taken that far and what's um, quite clearly local and regional government, we are um, fully supportive of, uh, um, you know, the principles of rule of law, um, um, quite clearly. But what we do have this concern that given the uh, this idea of penalising, quite clearly that would be used, the idea of conditionality of penalising, certain um, uh, countries, 
but n not just broadly speaking in terms of countries, but um, uh, areas and regions that uh, have shown you know, their, their need for funding. And I'm speaking obviously with regards to the other cohesion um, um, funds, uh, regional policy funds, and the use of those to penalize areas that will have shown their need. They will have demonstrated that they fulfill certain conditions right. um, for them. Um, uh, but nevertheless, the, the, the fact that certain governments at the state level or the central government level have um, um, have introduced um, um, certain uh, rules of law or actions that yeah. warrant that approach, um, to my mind, it begs the question about what that means for individual areas that... Um, so, you know, where, that I suppose, yes, yeah, so how, why yeah. should a region or an area be penalised when actually they're doing the right thing but the national state isn't, did you? Indeed. Yes, first, first of all, uh, it's a, a very difficult debate to organize the conditionality, I said, because it's uh, a proposal of the Commission, but it's in the end of the Council and then the Parliament. Of course, we have the support of the European Parliament about the conditionality. In the, uh, very large majority, I'm sure, of Parliament members are uh, supporting the process. At the Council level, there's a sort of link between the solidarity and the conditionality, because if you want to increase the solidarity during the crisis and uh, about uh, the recovery plan uh, among the member states, you need to, to convince the member state to be solidarity. And of course, there are financial reasons maybe to have some hesitations, but there are also some reasons in line with the rule of law. And uh, I have uh, uh, the conviction that uh, it will be easier to organize a solidarity at the EU level if we have a full compliance with our values in all the member states. And so the conditionality is also a part of such a, an evolution. A better solidarity among all the member states, but with a real uh, full respect for the rule of law. But you're right. Uh, we will uh, organize, if it's possible, the conditionality uh, to show that there's a problem, a real general deficiency about the rule of law in one member state. But it's not a reason why we need to penalize the beneficiaries of the funding. Not only regions, like you said, but also, uh, to give an example, the farmers receive a lot of uh, subsidies from the European Union. Why sanctions on the farmers or why sanctions on some, on some NGOs, maybe NGOs uh, of human rights defenders, due to the fact that there is a lack of uh, rule of law at the state level. So we have in our proposal some mechanism uh, to be sure that it's possible to maintain a real financing of the beneficiaries. So maybe regions, municipalities, or some actors like the farmers, I said, or NGOs and so on. And that's very important. Okay. Uh, it must be a real okay. uh, signal to the deficiencies about the rule of law at the state level, but not a cut in the financing of the uh, uh, beneficiaries. And so we have different ways to organize a direct financing or to use different tools. Uh, to be concrete, you spoke about the cohesion funds. I have discussed with my colleague Elisa Ferreira about that and we will uh, continue to work. If it's possible to have the mechanism of the conditionality, we will uh, organize the process to protect the beneficiaries. Didier, um, thank you very much for that very direct uh, response. Running out of time, I have less than uh, yeah. two or three minutes, but I've got a couple of questions. I've got one from Christina Wojtek. Christina, are you there? You've been very yes, patient. Yes, I'm there. Hello. Hello. Uh, can Hello. you introduce yourself, but please be, please be very brief and direct. Yeah. Uh, I'm coming back to the rule of law issue. I would like to know from you, Commissioner, how the situation in Poland is right now. Have you received an answer from the Polish government, how they tra transpose the recent um, decision from the European Court of Justice? And also concerning the new um, highest court uh, in Poland, how they will elect the president. I would also like to know if you have any news about that. Thank you. So so can you share with us directly? The election so of the president of the highest court of justice I, I, in Poland. Because there are two elections in Poland. Indeed yeah. there are. <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> Thank you. No. Uh, but it's a very direct question. What have you heard? What's, what's been on the wire so far that you've been able to make sense of? No, to be very concrete, the decision of the Court of Justice is binding in all the member states. And uh, is the reason why I, I'm perfect, I use this uh, answer to say that it's uh, with, on an equal footing uh, in all the member states. You know that we have react uh, about the decision of the uh, uh, Constitutional Court, Federal Constitutional Court in Germany, in Karlsruhe, because we want to repeat that uh, 
Uh, there is a real privacy of the EU law, and there is an exclusive competence of the ECG uh, to, inter to give an interpretation of the EU law. Of course, there is a sort of full independence of the uh, European Central Bank, that is another kind of issue, because the monetary policy is uh, an exclusive competence. But we need to analyze all the decisions uh, in the same way in all the member states. So, uh, about the decision of the 8th of April on the request of the Commission about interim measures, uh, I repeat that the decision is binding, and so we are analyzing for the moment the answer from the Polish government, because you know that the Polish government has one month to answer about the, the way to apply the decision, and uh, there is a link with the election at the head of the Supreme Court in Poland, because the previous president, uh, Mrs. Gazdorf, has decided to suspend all the procedures. Mm. Then we have had an acting president having maybe another position, uh, we are not so sure about the situation now, and we will have a new election at the uh, head of the uh, Supreme Court. So we are analyzing the situation now, and we will okay. give an answer very soon on the basis of the real binding effect of the ECG uh, ruling. Okay, so this is kind of a live issue, and hopefully, as you can imagine, yeah. people will be very concerned to know. But we'll come back but to the end in terms of the... One Sorry? month is now. It was the, the 8th and the 9th of May, so we are just in analysis. Indeed. The, the answer. I want to meet, move to Chris. Chris Mullmans, are you there? Hello. Chris, you need to unmute. Hello. Can you hear me? Okay, I've, unfortunately, I think technology has defeated us uh, in relation to Chris. I'm going to now move back to our citizens, if I may. So, Joe, Joe, I know that we have another question from our citizens uh, online platform, Debating Europe. Over to you. Yes, indeed. We have a, another question that's come in from, from Sarah. Uh, this one, it's uh, not, not a topic that's come up so far, but I, uh, I think it's an interesting one, nevertheless. Sarah says... Um, uh, you know, in an in a increasingly integrated Europe, criminals and terrorists don't recognize national borders, and she'd like to see some kind of European FBI, she says. Uh, and she asks, could the European Public Prosecutor's Office one day become this? Um, what would you, you say to Sarah's comment? <laughs> Interesting one. Over to you, Didi. First, Didi. first of all, I've been charged to install the uh, European Public Prosecutor Office this year, so I tried to see with Laura Covesi, the new uh, chief prosecutor. Uh, it's possible to start in November, uh, before the end of the year. But you know that the first task of the uh, European prosecutor is to protect the European budget for the moment. So we will work on it. And uh, my intention is to propose an evaluation after maybe uh, two years of functioning or something like that of the EPPO to see if it's possible to go uh, forward. Because I know that there are some uh, intentions to extend the competence of the EPPO to uh, cross-border terrorism, to give an example, but there are maybe other possibilities for the moment. Uh, we are trying to uh, install in a good uh, way the EPPO for the protection of the uh, European budget. There is a link eh, with the conditionality, because you know that the EPPO is competent for many member states, but not for Hungary and Poland. Uh, it's an optional uh, participation, and now Hungary and Poland have decided to stay out, so it's a uh, good reason to install not only the PPO but the conditionality. And about the way to uh, go uh, forward with uh, maybe uh, uh, a European FBI or something like that, you know that we are working for the moment with Europol and Eurojust, and we try to organize a good coordination and a good support for the different activities in the member states. To give an example, Europol was very active in the last months about the uh, investigation in relation with the murder of a journalist in Malta and with some success. So we try to be there to support the uh, actions. And uh, I want to conclude to say that during the crisis, it was very efficient because we have seen, thanks to your call, an increasing of uh, not only uh, the criminal, uh, criminal actions on the internet during the crisis, because you know that it was the case in the last uh, weeks during this uh, lockdown, but we have seen also uh, an increasing of the reaction of the uh, different um, uh, law enforcement authorities in charge of the fight against cyber criminality. 
and Europol was a real support. Sure. So th what so you're yeah, saying is that that could progress. be the potential to move it in that direction. Because well, well, I would, yes, should let you know that so we far. do have Matthew Kurana on Zoom. I know you're listening, and it'll be interesting to that you're hearing from the commissioner in relation to obviously the you know the tragic the tragedy that your family encountered, uh, but also what that's led to in terms of uh, transparency and accountability of the Maltese government to a certain extent. Um, <clears throat> And, you know, Matthew, if you do want to come and let me know, but uh, it's interesting that, you know, uh, what the commissioner said. I also have, um, we have another couple of questions. We have Chris again. Maybe Chris, the you... last one, because I will... Uh, Indeed, I will... we do. So I think Chris might be coming back. Is Chris there? I'll try. Can you hear me? Okay, yes. it's great. Uh, Chris Melderman, KBC. Uh, Mr. Rangers, uh, it's not the first crisis uh, we've went through uh, together. Um, but I want just to come back. Um, Can you just say who you are? From... So you're, you're from KBC. <laughs> what do you do? Uh, I've had European affairs okay. uh, and public affairs. Um, now, I, I want to come back on the German court ruling. Is the commission uh, going to react on this or are there any actions to be expected from the commission with regard to this ruling, which challenged in one go the European Central Bank and the European Court of Justice? Okay, thank you. Thank you. Very, very specific, very timely, well, uh, topical uh, question. Didier. I said, uh, we, we are very clear on it. So we need to analyze the situation on an equal footing in all the member states. It's the reason why I'm working on an annual report on all the member states and not just on one or another. Because it's very important to show that we are working in the same way. And there are two reactions. The first one, immediately, you have seen the, maybe the, the statement of the President of the Commission, Ursula von der Leyen, was very clear. Uh, we want to uh, reaffirm the different principles. The first one is the primacy of the EU law. The second one is the ex exclusive competence of the European Court of Justice for the interpretation of the EU law. And the third one, of course, if it's needed, is the full independence of the European Central Bank, because that's also very important to repeat as a European institution. That's the first reaction. And of course, you know that it's a complex uh, arrest and decision of the uh, uh, Court of Council. And so now we are analyzing the content of the decision to see what kind of reaction. But we, do, we want to, uh, to take a reaction on it and we don't want to hesitate about the different ways to do that so we will see uh, on the basis of the analysis what are the best arguments what is the best possible but again we will take all the necessary initiatives to protect those principles the privacy of the EU law the exclusive competence of the ECG and the independence of the uh, ECB it's very important and uh, if I may it's also very important because if we don't react about such a kind of situation, we'll have uh, use of the same uh, arguments maybe in other member states to try to explain the supremacy of the national constitution or the competence of the Supreme Court at the national level to decide about the intervention of the EU law. So it's very important to have the same reaction in all the member states on an equal footing. Dear, thank you very much. I know we're running out of time and you, you're running out of time in particular. Firstly, thank you for participating in this conversation because um, this and the others that we've had with Margreta and Marianne, others we're about to have also in the next coming weeks are all feeding into our State of Europe roundtable which will conclude in, in, in October but this is a, us thinking about what the implications about around rebuilding, transforming Europe into the future. Just that point you made earlier around uh, the consultation, you know very keenly that issues of fairness, equality and justice are at the heart of people's sense of trust in you and the institution. And that's, that's why people will be watching very carefully what you're doing, what you're going to do in the next few months. We invite you to come back to us on the back of your consultation so that this audience and the wider group will be able to engage with you in terms of the specific actions you're taking. Would you be up for that? Okay, fine. I, I've had many meetings with the Friends of Europe in the past. In the Indeed topic. you have. Indeed you yes, have. Uh, so thank you very much. No, no, thank you. But also to all the participants, because I know that uh, during this period of time, it's a, a way to discuss. I'm hoping that it will be possible again to discuss in the same room, maybe uh, in some weeks. But uh, 
It's a pleasure to discuss also by a video conference. No, thank you thank for you your time, much. Didier. It's very, very much appreciated. Can I just say to our Zoom participants that if you want to, you can continue uh, in a conversation if you fancy. We'll, you know, we'll, we won't be recording you, don't worry. You can have a chat amongst yourselves uh, and comment and, and react to what you've heard today. Didier, thank you very much and thank you all. Be safe, Bye -bye. mind your distance and take care. And we'll go on our website for the next set of events that we have online. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.